Ninjago means a lot to me. That might sound silly to say considering it's a Lego show about colorful ninja who fight bad guys, but I've always seen it as more than that. I've always seen Ninjago as a show that inspires creativity in kids and even adults. It sure has inspired me. And it makes sense that a Lego show would and should have the ability to expand the imaginations of kids everywhere. It's a show that really doesn't have to be as good as it is. After all, it's just meant to sell toys. Why would anyone put in more effort than they have to for what boils down to pretty much just a Lego commercial? And this is the viewpoint that a lot of people have or had when looking at Lego media. For example, when the Lego movie first got announced, it was met with backlash for being a blatant toy advertisement, and then people saw the movie and it was one of the funniest and most heartfelt animated films to release that year. So believe me when I say that I love Ninjago. I've grown up with it and I've been with it since the very beginning. The show is truly a hidden gem, and to see that it would be getting a full proper conclusion after a 10 plus year story was really really exciting. Not many shows get to have proper conclusions and even though Ninjago is technically going to be continuing, we still got to see a season that acts as a finale to everything that came before it. But the big question is, does it actually stick the landing? Does Ninjago Crystallize present a satisfying conclusion to the Ninjago Saga? Well buckle up as I spend a really really long time analyzing each and every part of the season to answer that question. Crystallize definitely had a lot on its plate, but one of the biggest questions going in was, how is this going to follow up on Seabound? Seabound ended with Nia sacrificing herself and becoming one with the sea, and while this technically isn't a character death, it is presented to the audience as one, with them holding a full-on funeral after her departure. The implication in the story is that Nia, as we know her to be, is gone. And this ending creates a lot of interesting possibilities for where the story could go next. As I said in my video discussing death in Ninjago, character deaths allow for new conflicts and solutions to existing dynamics and scenarios. So we can easily identify that the loss of Nia could drastically change the dynamics of two characters, those being Jay and Kai, while also having an effect on many other characters as well. The conflict between Jay and Kai, however, is what Crystallize chose to explore most when it comes to the change in character dynamics within the first few episodes. Starting with Kai, Crystallize shows that after the passing of Nia, Kai has gone off to train with his own ninja class, becoming his own teacher. He describes that he's teaching these students to be ruthless and unforgiving because, well, some bad guys just don't play fair. After losing Nia, he isn't willing to let back. At least, that's what he says. As we see later, he doesn't really seem to have kept this motto. Moving on to Jay, we see him alone in the lighthouse for what appears to have been a very long time. Jay has gone a bit of the crazy route, attempting to talk with Nia through glasses of water. He describes that he feels that nobody cares anymore about Nia's departure and that everyone's moved on and forgot. But of course he is quickly proven wrong by the lanterns that quickly appear, initially sent into the sea in Nia's honor. And yeah, these two characters have beautifully written character setups in the first episode. Kai's especially makes a lot of sense for his character and has the potential for some really interesting stories. Seeing Kai not hold back due to the fact that he was unable to save his sister it has the potential for a really cool story and perhaps an arc for Kai that hasn't been explored. Jay's characterization is also done very well, with him feeling like nobody cares about Nia's disappearance. Of course he's quickly proven wrong however, so we don't get much time with this version of Jay. The other characters also get some pretty good setups as well. Zane deactivating his emotion meter due to grief getting in the way of his productivity is quite sad and it creates a unique solution for Zane that is only possible due to the fact that he is a robot. Then we have Lloyd, giving up being a ninja due to the fact that he couldn't protect Nia and doesn't want to be responsible for anyone ever again. And this is probably the weakest out of the character intros, but it serves its purpose pretty well. The problem I have with it is that Lloyd has rarely been shown to be the leader in recent seasons leading up to Crystallized, so his need to feel responsible for everyone on the team doesn't really highlight his personal struggles as much as the other characters' intros do. I honestly think it would have made a lot more sense to give this setup to Wu. Wu's already been shown to have some doubts about being a sensei, and while he was able to overcome these doubts, it would only make sense that after losing one of his pupils, this would of course cause these doubts to creep back up again, causing him to second guess whether or not he's really good enough to keep the ninja safe. But either way, these character intros are really really well done, and it's nice to see where all the ninja are at, and it acts as a really good way to set up their character arcs for the season. You know, the character arcs that they, um, they definitely have. Like I just described, Crystallize does an amazing job setting up all its major characters for potential arcs and growth. 
but unfortunately, the season doesn't really seem interested in exploring these characters further than the surface level, if even that. Nia's disappearance does affect the team for sure, but not as much as it probably should have. The main factor in this is the fact that Nia does indeed return. So let's talk about her first so we can understand the dynamics of the other main characters. When Nia's quote-unquote death is mentioned in Crystallize, it's referred to as her disappearance. Nia has disappeared, not died. This works in the season's favor at first glance, because it allows us to understand that realistically, if Nia disappeared, she could theoretically be found as well. But the issue comes with the way that her quote-unquote death is presented in Seabound's finale. In the final episode of Seabound, the ninja team hold a funeral for Nia. This moment is fully presented as a character death. Even though Nia technically didn't die, the show presents it as such. This contrast between the Seabound finale and the Crystallized premiere begins the ever-growing rift between the end of Seabound and the beginning of Crystallized. And it's clear to me now that Crystallized wasn't written with the goal of building off the end of Seabound. It was written with the goal of fixing Seabound's ending, to return things to the inevitable status quo. A disappointing choice, to say the least. So, what does this mean for Nia? Well, of course, it means that she had to come back. Episode 2 does a good job of exploring Nia's mindset after being turned into the sea. She has forgotten who she is, but she saves people out of habit. To me, this is Nia's perfect state, a powerful entity that roams around Ninjago's endless sea, saving fallen sailors and doing her part to keep people safe. This is where Nia's story should have ended, but Chrysalize decides that it's not over. After talking with Niad, Nia quickly regains her memories in what I believe is truly just a beautiful scene. Everything from the framing, to the lighting, to the shots that they chose in the animation, the flashbacks that they pick, it's just really, really good stuff. So after finding the lighthouse and returning to the sea, she of course wants to go back home. The logistics of Nia remembering who she is already doesn't really make too much sense. Nia in her water form was previously shown to be overtaken by the sea, bound to the responsibility of being one with the ocean, even when in the shape of her old self. But here she's able to be her normal human self and think as her normal human self, well in her water form. It kinda seems to contradict the consequences of her water form. The impression that I got from Seabound is that once Nia was in her water form, it was impossible for her to be her true self. She had to comply with the ocean. So it seems weird to me that here, she's able to just act as her normal self, even after regaining her memories. Because it's not like all her memories just instantly vanished. She still had her memories in the Seabound finale, but lost them gradually over time. And on top of that, the fact that Nia is able to quickly remember everything about herself feels like a rushed solution to a problem that didn't really need to actually be solved. The season acts as a Nia coming back is something that needs to happen, but I feel like it would have been more interesting if it just didn't. I think the story would have benefited if Nia just didn't return. But if this is the direction that the season wants to take, then let's explore it further, shall we? So Nia soon realizes that if she can give up her powers, she can join her friends again. She also brings up her greatest fear about being powerless and how she doesn't believe that it's her biggest fear anymore. And I'm really glad to see this mentioned because this mentality for Nia is a good reminder that she has grown a lot as a character. It makes the motivation for Nia wanting to return make a bit of sense, even if the logistics of Nia being able to return is still a bit flimsy. And the plan to bring back Nia by removing her powers does make sense. So Nia, after realizing how she can return, goes to the ninja and tells them how they can get her back. And I think it's important that we see Nia instigate the plan to get herself back, even if I don't believe her returning was a good idea for the story of Crystallized. I really enjoy that she is the one to instigate the plan, and that her motives for coming back are consistent with her overcoming her fears. The characterization for Nia here is still kept intact, but that falls apart once she's officially revived. After being brought back by Asphira, Nia's character kinda takes a nosedive into what could possibly be one of her worst showings yet, if not her worst showing ever. Like I said in my character death video, bringing a character back can work, and it can be done well, but they need to have something new to do. Bringing Nia back has already destroyed the potential for the infinite amounts of interesting stories that could have been told if she stayed gone. 
but the fact that they don't do anything new or interesting with Nia while also bringing her character down and reversing a lot of her development is a terrible thing for Crystallized. So let me explain why Nia and Crystallized just does not work. Upon returning, Nia has decided that she wants to be Samurai X. There are immediately a few issues with this decision. For starters, this conclusion is one that she came to all the way back in Rise of the Snakes, the show's first season. This not only feels repetitive, but also indicates that Nia has not changed or grown as a person since season 1. This is extremely disappointing to see as someone who has endlessly praised Nia's character development over the series, because now, well, none of it matters. Nia has just been reverted back to Season 1 Nia, and honestly, a worse version of Season 1 Nia. Secondly, Nia becoming Samurai X implies that you cannot be a ninja if you don't have powers, which is a bit ridiculous considering that this season introduces the new ninja, a group of ninja that are shown to be more competent than the original ninja, and they don't have powers. In my opinion, it would have made a lot more sense for Nia to undergo an arc where she learns that you don't have to have powers to be a ninja. This would be new for for Nia and would indicate that she has fully overgrown her fear of being powerless. If they were going to bring Nia back, I think that the route of her fully embracing herself as part of the team even without powers would have been the best route to take her character. And last but not least, Pixel already exists. Yeah, it feels kind of strange to have Nia also become Samurai X with Pixel having nothing to say about it. And going into part 2, I thought that this would end up making Pixel kind of irrelevant. But if anything, it makes Nia extremely irrelevant as all the mechanic work in Sam X Spotlight is still given to Pixel. And Nia kind of just gets completely sidelined. Pixel, after being practically replaced by Nia as Samurai X, still gets more to do during the season. Making Nia Samurai X reduces her to the B team while also having her constantly be in the shadow of Pixel. Nia's role in the team is completely pointless. So it really begs the question, what was the point of bringing this character back if you're just gonna immediately sideline her and make her even more irrelevant than Pixel, a side character that hasn't really had much since season 3? And no hate to Pixel by the way, Pixel's great, but still ultimately not very relevant to the plots of many seasons. Well, Nia has been relevant to the plots of many seasons, including having her very own season, literally right before this one. And it doesn't help that the entire cast has pretty much no reaction to Nia being back, the moment in which she returns feels extremely anticlimactic. There's a little moment with Jay yelling out of happiness and Lloyd saying that it was worth it when they're all in handcuffs, so that's really good stuff. Really, really impactful, but that's as far as it goes. Once the ninja go to prison, it's like nothing ever happened. The fact that Nia was in the ocean for an entire year is practically never brought up again outside of a few throwaway lines, and it kind of just makes you wonder, what was the point? Why end Seabound like that if you aren't going to do anything interesting to follow it up? Why leave us on that ending for over a year only to show that it didn't actually matter? Why spend six episodes of your 30 episode season just to return things to the status quo? There was so much potential after the ending of Seabound that was ultimately just wasted. Nia does not feel like a character in Crystallized. She feels like a plot device, like a punching bag for the villains of the season. And yes, things get even worse for Nia. Nia having to give up her powers to become human was a good idea, since it allows there to still be consequences for Nia's merge with the ocean. But, you know, it doesn't actually matter since we learn that she's able to get her powers back. Just like Kai did in the Fire chapter. Nia's powers slowly return. The last sliver of Seabound consequences, gone. And yeah, during a lot of the seasons, the villains mock Nia for not having powers and being useless without them, and this seems like an obvious setup for her having an eventual, you know, arc where she proves them wrong by defeating them without her elements, but that doesn't happen. There seems to be a rivalry between her and the mechanic especially, with the mechanic being the one to target her the most. It would have made the most sense for her to end up defeating the mechanic without using powers, but instead, she defeats him by relying on her powers and her allies. The mechanic's absolutely wrong viewpoint is proven correct by the season. Crystallize presents Nia as a helpless and weak damsel in distress. After being in her most powerful form, she is now presented at her weakest. But it doesn't have to be this way. Nia is a character that can and should be powerful even without her powers. A ninja can be a ninja without their powers, and that's really the message that the season should have been trying to send. Not only because it's thematically consistent with Nia's character, but also because it's just a good message. Like in a show focused on so many characters with super extreme powers that usually rely on them to save the day, 
It would have been really cool to have a season that focuses on the fact that you don't have to be someone gifted with powers to be really helpful and save the day. It genuinely just would have been an inspiring message to send to kids, but what do we get instead? Ni is a character that's meant to inspire young girls like how the other ninja inspired young boys, but what are they gonna think when they see how Nia is presented and crystallized? What message is the sending? It's the exact opposite of what Nia's character is supposed to represent. There are so many directions they could have taken with Nia and Crystallize, but ultimately, they regressed her character so far to the point where she isn't even a character anymore. It's truly sad to see what happened to Nia. She had one of the best character arcs, if not the best character arc in the entire series, only to be completely ruined by its final season. But okay, enough about Nia. What about the other characters? Like I said at the start of the video, Jay and Kai had really good introduction scenes in Crystallized, even if they were a bit rushed. We got to see a little bit of rivalry between Jay and Kai at the start of the season. The dynamic between Jay and Kai at the start is written really well because Nia's departure has affected them in different ways that both contrast each other. Kai is more motivated due to Nia's departure and Jay is the exact opposite. It creates an interesting dynamic and the dialogue between the two is really really good, but the issue is that this doesn't last long. Kai and Jay get to a breaking point, where in the process of mocking Jay, Kai accidentally knocks over a glass of water that Jay believes to have Nia inside. A fight scene ensues, it's about 10 seconds, and then nothing is ever done with Jay and Kai for the rest of the season. The dynamic between Jay and Kai is really strong in the first few episodes, and it would have been really cool to see them have to get over their differences and make amends, but since Nia's immediately shown to be back, the entire plotline is thrown out the window. It also feels strange that the breaking point that caused them to fight was Kai spilling a glass of water. The thing with Jay in the water was that it was played off as a joke for the first episode, therefore it's not really something that I took seriously. So when Kai spills over the glass of water, it seems like a moment that they would have Jay jokingly scramble to get the water back in the glass but instead is used as the linchpin for what is supposed to be a serious moment. This makes it so that I really can't take the moment as seriously, since they're literally just fighting over a glass of spilled water. Other than that, however, the scene is done extremely well, which is why I wish we saw more of it. I wish we got to see what Jay and Kai's dynamic was like more, and while bringing Nia back is a big reason as to why we didn't get to see more of this dynamic, I think it represents a bigger problem with the season as a whole, but I will get into that more later. First, let's finish discussing the rest of the other characters. Zane is pretty interesting at the start of the season, since he spends quite a bit of episodes with his emotion meter turned off. He eventually learns that there's a benefit to all emotions through an episode that we'll talk about later. Zane turning his emotion meter off is a cool idea, since it's a unique solution to something that's only possible because Zane is a robot, and only possible because of Nia's departure. And it also calls back to the fact that Zane has had his memory switch turned off by Dr. Julian for a similar reason. The thing is, why did Zane need to learn about emotion? Why didn't he just turn his emotion meter back on once Nia was back? Why would he even still be worried about grief once he knows that Nia is okay? I think it would have made a lot more sense for him to turn his emotion meter back on once Nia was brought back. It also doesn't help that once his emotion meter is turned on, all Zane does for the rest of the season is have some cool plane battles and another fake out death. Which by the way is extremely common in this season. I also feel that it's important that I talk about the return of the Ice Emperor. This may be the biggest hot take in the video, but I personally don't have too much problem with this. I do, however, feel that this was a very bad title to use for the episode, as it really built fan expectations higher than they should have been. I never for a second believed that Crystallize would have the time or the ability to expand upon the ending of the Ice Chapter, as I believe that ship has long sailed, and even if they wanted to follow up on it, it would have been a bit too late by this point. For context, I'm not really a huge fan of how the Ice Chapter ended, I feel like it was very rushed and left me with a lot of questions. Kinda similar to a finale that we'll be talking about later in the video actually. But Crystallize definitely was not the time to have Zane's actions addressed after the events of the Ice Chapter, since at this point it happened a really long time ago. So my expectations were not very high for this episode. This caused me to not really be disappointed by the use of the Ice Emperor, and I even found some of the lines between him and Pixel to be quite funny, but I'll admit this episode completely disregards the character that the Ice Emperor 
is. In the Ice Chapter, the Ice Emperor is really never played as a joke. He always is presented as a serious threat who did pretty terrible things, all things considered. So the fact that they decided that this would be a good character to have be the butt of a joke doesn't really make too much sense, especially when you consider the fact that Zane has had many other alter egos that have been treated as jokes such as Snake Jaguar or Zane Noir. And it really seems like this episode title and premise was just made to drum up hype and get fans excited. But due to the fact that the Ice Emperor is completely mishandled, it falls flat. Don't get me wrong, I love some goofy Zane and Pixel episodes and I'm really glad we got one in Crystallized, but the Ice Emperor is not the alter ego that should have been chosen for Zane. It also doesn't help that this is the reason that Zane goes unconscious and has a fake out death moment. Once again, something that is played off as a joke, being used as the linchpin for a dramatic moment. It just doesn't work. And speaking of Zane's death, not only is this Zane's fourth fake-out death, but it's also the third fake-out death in this season alone. And there's more after this. Pixel's speech to Zane is extremely powerful and beautifully acted and written, with her even mentioning the afterlife, which I thought was a surprising moment for Ninjago, but it doesn't actually matter since we know Zane's gonna be okay. I want to be invested in this moment so bad, but I can't be because there's no stakes here. And the thing is, you could still have had this speech, and here's how. Have Zane be recovered without a problem, but since Pixel and the gang have to make it back to the newspaper warehouse, since it's super dangerous outside in order to get there, have Pixel give a speech to Zane in the context of having a feeling that they may not make it back alive. Then you could still have this powerful scene, just switch the context so that I'm not completely drawn out of the moment. Having this be yet another fake-out death for the season just leaves me feeling annoyed more than anything. And with every single fake-out death, the stakes of the season lower even more. Oh, and also one last thing of note for Zayn, he gets the best dragon form fight scene bar none. Even if it only lasts 5 seconds. So yeah, there's that. Overall, his emotion meter arc was a good idea but slightly mishandled. The return of the Ice Emperor was a huge misunderstanding of a potentially interesting character, and Zane's 57th fake out death leaves me feeling more annoyed than emotionally invested. Moving on to Cole, I feel like he had a really good start with him being the one to bring the ninja back together and be the rational thinker of the group, while everyone else is still flustered by Nia's disappearance. But then for the rest of the season, he's just there. Vangelis the Skull Sorcerer has returned, and they get one interaction the entire season, and it's in the second to last episode. Now, this is more of an issue with the Crystal Council itself than an issue with Cole, but the fact that Cole barely even mentions his existence is really disappointing. I'm glad that he remembered about Vanya's promise to bring the entire army of Shintar to his aid, but he couldn't even remember the fact that she was a queen and not a princess. You're the one who needs to get to to some queen. Princess. Princess Vanya <laughs> And yeah, it's so weird that Crystallize is full of these weird little lore inconsistencies, which normally would seem like a nitpick, but there's so many of them to the point where it's a genuine complaint with the entire season. Not a big complaint, mind you, but still really odd. But yeah, overall, Cole barely feels like he's in the season. Definitely the most overshadowed and underused out of the four OG ninja. Especially after Master of the Mountain set him up to be so much better than this. Seabound and Crystallized, two L's for Cole in a row, feels bad. And honestly, the four original ninja overall just feel extremely underused for what is supposed to be the ending of a saga. They all just get really small subplots, which is nice, but none of them are specific to them as characters. None of them challenge or change them. It just kind of seems like stuff for them to do to pad out time while the more important characters are having their stories being told. And I don't expect every single one of these characters to go through an arc, even though I feel like that could have been possible given the time and setup they had, but it would have been nice to see all these characters go through situations that were specific to them and their struggles as characters, because ultimately, that's what makes a character's journey so interesting. And when you have them just doing pointless side plot stuff the whole time, they don't really feel that important to the overall story of the season. And honestly, their banter isn't even that good compared to other seasons. Like, Prime Empire had better ninja banter than this. It's either all just boring expository stuff or Jay being really annoying. Like, I feel like this is the first season where Jay's jokes actually actively got on my nerves. He wasn't great in Seabound, but he really is not great here. And I honestly think out of the OG4, Kai is the best portrayed. His stuff with Skylar is pretty fun, and honestly his dialogue feels just at home with his early season 1 self. Like, it's not like he acts angry or hot-headed or anything, but just the kind of vibe that Kai has during the season feels very nostalgic. And he probably consistently got the best lines out of all the OG4 ninja. I think the cheese slid off Jay's cracker. Uh, we were repairing the AC? <laughs> we're not keeping track, but uh, who's number one? Maybe Jay was right about there being a secret entrance. Wouldn't that be crazy? 
Jay being right? If someone asks, can this get worse? It always gets worse. <laughs> I didn't know your vehicle could fly. It can't. It can't. Let me get this straight. To assume dragon form, we have to jump up, kick back, whip around, and spin? But in a really ironic twist of fate, Pixel actually overshadows all of them. She gets more focus and more character-specific plot relevance than all the OG Ninja and Nia. She gets really good action scenes, she builds and upgrades all the ninja's vehicles, she brings Zane to Borg Tower and reunites with Borg, while also allowing Ronin and his crew to get new mechs for the final battle. And she has the combo mech. Pixel is the true MVP of the ninja team, and honestly one of the only characters this season that I don't really have any issues with. So now it's time to move on to some of the big players of the season, starting with... Wu in this season is an interesting case, because while he is the coolest he has ever been, he's also kind of the lamest he's ever been, so let me explain. At the start of the season, Wu is completely against the idea of letting Asphira out of prison, even though he knows it will bring Nia back. It's really odd to see how even when Nia's back, he's still upset that the ninja broke the law. Like, they free Nia, everyone else finds it worth it except for him. I understand why he would be worried about Asphira, but Wu out of all people should understand that the risk far outweighs the benefit of the situation. Regardless, this is all set up for an arc where Wu learns that it's okay to break the law as long as it's for the greater good. Which is an oddly specific mini arc that Wu goes through, but it ties back to the whole idea of him not taking initiative when he should, which is strange because it seems that he already learned this lesson back in Master of the Mountain. And I wouldn't mind him repeating this lesson as long as the reason for him going through it again made sense. And to an extent it does, but it just kind of makes him seem a bit unlikable. And it's just kind of weird for him to not want to go along with the ninja's plan. And it doesn't help that Wu also has this arc again later in the season. After being defeated by the Overlord, he retreats to the newspaper warehouse and just gives up. That is until he's inspired by Nelson to keep fighting. There are so many situations where Wu would rather give up and do nothing rather than keep fighting. Since when did Wu become so unmotivated? Master of the Mountain gave him a reason to feel this way. He believed that his days as a master were over and that the ninja didn't need him anymore. But by the end of the season, he realizes that he is still needed. So do we really need this arc again? twice in the same season? Like, I think the first arc would have been fine on its own, even if I question Wu's decision making here just a tiny bit, but then it happens again, and I'm just wondering, what's the point? Why dedicate screen time to this? On top of that, Wu knew the Overlord would return, but like Wu tends to do, he never told the ninja because he believed that he wouldn't return for another few generations. So instead of taking the action to stop the Overlord from returning before it happens, or even just taking the time to warn the ninja, he put off until tomorrow what could have been done for the last however many years. But on the other side of the coin, you have all the moments in the season where Wu is bar none the coolest character in Crystal Eyes. Like, come on, what other character even comes close when it comes to the sheer amount of coolness factor alone? Wu does not hold back this season. He knows what's at stake, and we get to see why he is the master. He takes on three villains at once, and the fight between him and the Overlord is one of the coolest fights in the show. Wu finally gets the spotlight that he deserves after so many seasons. So while Wu is really cool this season, his character still dissatisfied me a bit. Mostly because I think that the season had the potential to be an amazing story for Wu. A Wu season, if you will. It really feels like everything was leading up to a Wu death. They were putting a lot of spotlight on him, with his mini arc to a wide array of action scenes. It seemed like a suspicious amount of Wu focus, and it feels like the writers planned to initially kill him right here, right after he loses the fight with the Overlord. Think about it. This was Wu's mission, to fight off the embodiment of evil and darkness as the literal son of the first Spinjutsu master, and while he fails, he took initiative and proved why he is Master Wu, and on that note, he dies leaving Lloyd to finally fulfill his legacy and defeat the Overlord once and for all, in honor of his fallen master. After all these years of Wu's teachings and mentorship, Lloyd would now have to handle the burden all on his own. But instead, Wu lives, and doesn't really have anything left to do for the rest of the season. After this loss, he just gives up and repeats his Master of the Mountain arc again, and the impact that Wu's death could have left on the story could have been huge if done correctly. And no, I don't want Wu to have died because it would have made the season darker or more mature. No, it's because the story potential there is limitless and thematically, that is a perfect moment for Wu to die. 
Usually in media, the mentor character dies so that the main character can continue to grow and learn. Take Spider-Man, for instance. It's only because of the loss of Uncle Ben that Peter Parker learns what it actually means to be Spider-Man. For years, we have been shown the idea of Lloyd becoming the master of the ninja team, but that has never happened and can't happen unless Wu goes away. Lloyd as a character cannot progress, much like Peter Parker wouldn't be able to progress if Uncle Ben didn't die. If anything, Wu still being here has stunted the series. There are so many directions you could go just by removing this character alone, and I think Crystallized would have been the perfect time to do it. Overall, Wu is amazing this season, yet left me feeling a bit disappointed in the potential that he had. The fact that he also repeated his Master of the Mountain arc twice is a little strange as well, and I feel as if the season was building up to a character death and decided to just not go through with it at the last second, leaving him with nothing really to contribute for the remainder of the season. But now it's time that we get to who is supposedly the main character of Crystallized, Lloyd Garmadon himself. So with Lloyd, there's a lot to cover, so I'm going to split the section into multiple subsections. First will be Lloyd and Harumi, then Lloyd and Garmadon, and finally Lloyd and the Oni arc. So yeah, not only did Crystallize bring Nia back, but it also brought Harumi back. And Harumi this whole time was the fabled Vengestone buyer, and to be honest, I kind of like this idea. As Harumi says, the best villain is the one you never knew was there in the first place, and it makes a lot of sense that she would be the one secretly buying and hoarding all of this Vengestone. I find it really funny that she has been so close to being spotted by the ninja on multiple occasions, and the way that the Vengestone plot ties into Shitaro is extremely satisfying to see unfold. But what doesn't make much sense is that Harumi's oddly okay with working with the Overlord, you know, the guy who was known for taking over and destroying Ninjago, something that she definitely would not be okay with, especially considering her experiences in Hunted. The thing with Harumi is that she wanted to get revenge on the ninja, more specifically Lloyd, for not being able to stop the Great Devourer and save her parents. She does this by summoning Garmadon in order to make Lloyd feel the same pain that she felt when she lost her parents. But something I've realized over time, however, is that her motivations never actually really made perfect sense in the Oni trilogy either. She hates Lloyd for not saving the day, but he was, you know, a literal child? <laughs> like, what was he supposed to do? He hadn't even learned Spinjitsu yet. And secondly, if you're so against having people get hurt, other than Lloyd and the ninja obviously, then why attack Ninjago City? Why go out of your way to imprison everyone? This second point slightly works because right before her death, and an ironic twist of fate, Harumi is put in mortal danger due to her actions. She became oblivious to the destruction she was actually causing and in that moment had a small redemption. It was a bit of a weird road to get to that point, but overall I believe that Harumi had a pretty solid story, one of the most in-depth character stories in Ninjago history. But her motivations have never really fully made sense. This is why Harumi joining the Overlord doesn't actually bother me too much. Is it strange that she would go through with the Overlord's plans? Yeah, it doesn't really seem like something she would do, but isn't it also kind of strange for her to be okay with the mass amount of damage she caused in Hunted? Like, she shows some remorse for it, but overall, I feel like Harumi's motives have always been kind of sketchy. So perfect, right? Harumi's role in the story makes sense and fits in with her previous experiences. Well, here's the thing. Well, I like the way that they explain her return, everything she does after this backstory is questionable at best and actual series damaging at worst. Like, oh my goodness did they mess up Harumi in the season. And not only did they mess up Harumi, but they also ruined the dynamic between her and Lloyd. So, let's explore this, shall we? So, first off, Harumi is practically a different character. And not just in this season, but in every episode she appears in during the season. Lloyd and Harumi switch their personalities every single episode. One episode, Harumi is mad at Lloyd and acting all evil, but then the next episode, she's all sympathetic towards Lloyd. One episode, Lloyd is scared and confused, and then the next episode, he's quippy and confident. These characters don't stay consistent. From the start, Harumi already seems a bit off personality-wise, but this is a change that I enjoy in certain scenes. But the fact is, her personality isn't consistent with her personality in the Oni trilogy. She's more jokey and less serious than before. And you know what? This version of Harumi is actually pretty entertaining, but she doesn't stay consistent. Out of nowhere, she goes from hating Lloyd to feeling sympathetic towards him in the next episode. Now, I understand many people will point to this and say, well, the reason Harumi changes personalities is because she wants to deal with Lloyd herself because she feels insignificant after the Overlord arrives. But this is never explained in the show 
Therefore, it's just pure speculation. If that's the angle the writers were going for, then cool, that's a great idea for a Harumi-centric story, but that idea is never actually explored. So Harumi decides that she doesn't want Lloyd to die and goes against the Crystal Council to try and get him to join her. But then in the next episode, her personality changes again. Now in this episode, she doesn't want Lloyd to die and literally attacks him. She also decides that she does want to help with the Crystal Council after derailing the operations earlier. What is your goal here? She wants Lloyd to join the council and not get hurt, but then repeatedly tries to hurt him. And also something to consider, Harubi isn't mad at Lloyd for not stopping the Great Devour anymore. No, she's mad at Lloyd because he let a building fall on her. Let me remind you, Lloyd was powerless and on the other side of the city. But that doesn't actually matter because it's revealed that the entire time that Harumi actually had feelings for Lloyd. What? what? Was it the whole point of Harumi that she had a fake persona to hide her real intentions away from Lloyd and that she used him to get what she wanted? She says in that season that she never cared for him. No, Lloyd. There was never anything between us. Knowing this information now changes the entire context of Sons of Garmadon and Hunted. Harumi as a character has been completely misunderstood and crystallized. It's okay if they wanted to take the character in a new direction, in fact that's what I encourage when it comes to bringing back a character from the dead, but what they do with Harumi isn't at all consistent and actively goes against what she was supposed to be in the Oni trilogy. And how did they resolve Harumi's character in the season? Oh, well, yeah, she's just, uh, she's a good guy now. Yeah, you know all the stuff she did? You know how she mentally tormented Lloyd? You know how she revived one of Ninjago's baddest villains? You know how she helped the Overlord form a giant Vengestone army in order to offset the balance of Ninjago? Well, it turns out that the Overlord she was actually helping had questionable motives and isn't a good person. If only a wise, experienced mentor had warned you- So, her roommate learns that the Overlord was the one to control the Great Devourer, and absolutely loses it. And to be honest, I actually think this is a really good moment for Harumi. She finally realizes who she should actually be directing her anger towards, even though, you know, she was never actually Manaloid because she was in love with him the whole time, but whatever, I digress. This is honestly a strong moment for her and is a good turning point for her redemption, but that doesn't mean this should automatically clear her of all the bad stuff she did in the past. Not to mention how rushed and contrived it felt. There are so many good reasons for Harumi to actually be upset with the Overlord, why make up a new reason on the spot? And you know, I'm someone that actually had a little faith in a Harumi redemption. I think it's something that could have worked if done correctly. But what we got was extremely inconsistent, rushed, and overall sends a really bad message. If they wanted to redeem Harumi then sure, go ahead, but at least put her in jail by the end. She should not have been rewarded by the end of this. This isn't how her story should have ended. In my opinion, it should have ended in Hunted. So what's Lloyd's role in all of this? Well, like I said before, Lloyd is equally inconsistent when it comes to his motives and personality. First he's confused, then confident, then he does something that I will never understand. Instead of escaping the Oni Temple by himself, he takes Harumi with him. Okay, well, maybe he still had feelings and wants to try and rekindle that relationship. Pretty weird considering what she had done in the past, but okay. If this is where the Raiders are going, let's see where it goes. Well, actually no, because now Lloyd is mad at Harumi and wants nothing to do with her. Genuinely, like, what was his goal when taking her with him? What was the point? And let me just throw this out there that I really like the dynamic that they shared in this episode. But I also really like the dynamic that they shared in the previous episodes. The issue is, it keeps changing. Harumi and Lloyd have always been incredibly entertaining to watch on screen, and while they are still entertaining in this season, they're never consistent. So I spent more time asking questions and actually enjoying the scenes that they share. And this episode also starts the trend of, Lloyd is kinda just a huge jerk. Having a character act angry is fine. And in fact, Lloyd has every right to be angry at Harumi, but it gets to the point where it's kinda just hard to sympathize with him. And that's where we get into Lloyd's other dynamic this season. Let me just get this out of the way. Garmadon is fantastic. Honestly, one of, if not the best part of Crystallized. He's extremely funny, incredibly entertaining, and he's just a lot of fun to see back. But even he is not completely spared from criticism. Also, when talking about Garmadon, I'm just gonna disregard the comic series and pretend like it doesn't exist because, you know, it's pretty much exactly what Crystallized does, so why even bother? And while it is kind of weird that they completely disregard the comics, to the point where their canonicity is still up in the air, 
I'm not gonna hold that against the season, due to the fact that the production of both of these things probably just did not end up aligning the way that the creators intended it to. So could the Garmadon comics still be canon? Yeah, they could, but when talking about Garmadon, I'm not gonna take them into account, I'm just gonna judge what's in the actual season itself. So it does make a lot of sense that Garmadon would return in the season, but the question Crystal Eyes had to answer is where has he been this whole time? And I gotta say, having him be Vinny's roommate is fantastic, and I really like how they built off that moment from March of the Oni, where Vinny teaches Garmadon about the values of life. And maybe this doesn't really matter to most, but for me, I'm kinda left with some questions as to how Garmadon was undetected by the ninja for so long, even though he was supposedly in Ninjago City this entire time. Or at least, for a good chunk of time. Every season out of March of the Oni, and before Crystal Eyes, implied that he had gone elsewhere, away from Ninjago City. And even earlier this season, Lloyd said nobody knows where his father is. It's not really that big a deal, I'll admit, but... I feel like Garmanon's off-screen character development could have been explored in a more interesting way. Could he have gone elsewhere? Yes, he could have, but he never explains any of that in his flashbacks. And in fact, he never even really alludes to it. And it's just really strange to me that Garmanon spent so much time in Ninjago City in the public eye and the ninja never knew about it. Does the scene make for some funny gags? Yeah, for sure it does, and overall it's a really entertaining flashback sequence. And my complaints with it are really not a big deal in the grand scheme of the season, but I did think it was something that I might as well point out. So besides that, the way he acts this season is incredible, and it's honestly just a funnier version of his movie counterpart, which is kind of odd also. But hey, he's been living with Vinny, he's gone through a lot in between this season and March of the Oni, so it makes sense that he would change quite a bit. I just feel like he changed a bit too drastically in between two season appearances, but it's kind of hard to complain when he's so entertaining in the season. But it's kind of like a case with Harumi and some of the other returning characters, to where I feel like the writers don't fully understand how Garmadon is expected to act, but this new version of Garmadon still stays pretty in line with what Garmadon is supposed to be, it's just very exaggerated, and it's very different from what we're used to seeing, especially from his resurrected form. I kind of think of it mostly as March of the Oni Garmadon mixed with Season 2 Garmadon. He's kind of got those goofy qualities that we see in Rise of the Snakes and Season 2, but you can see a lot of that March of the Oni side of him, where he's trying to help in his own way and getting very frustrated with Lloyd especially, as he truly does feel like he's above the other ninja and that his powers are the only way to victory. Which, yeah, again, is very similar to how he acted in March of the Oni. So while at first Garmadon's personality is a bit jarring, it's easy to kind of see where they got these traits from, and it still stays in line with Garmadon as a character. So I can definitely accept this change, especially with the large time skip that we saw with the character, and given the circumstances of him living with Vinny. And overall, it's just really interesting to look back and see Garmadon's journey over all the different seasons of Ninjago, and I think this is definitely one of the most entertaining versions of the character. He's funny, he's cool, and he's actually got some heart this time around. Around, and Garmadon in this season is finally learning how to have compassion in his new Oni form, which is something that Oni aren't really known to have. We get to see the story unfold through his love of Christopher, and honestly, this plant is just such a smart writing decision. It's the perfect tool for setting up emotional conflict. If anything happens to that plant, you best know Garmadon is gonna have a reaction to it. On the surface, it's a really funny concept with some comedic payoff, but it's also a strong storytelling vehicle. Since Lloyd clearly doesn't seem to care about him, the plant is all Garmadon has to really care for. Garmadon wasn't there for Lloyd when he needed him, but Christopher was his chance to try again. But when it comes to the Garmadon and Lloyd dynamic, this is where I have some issues. Okay, so Lloyd is somewhat justified in being a jerk to Garmadon. Sure. But he feels really unlikable here. Every scene with him and Garmadon is just Lloyd yelling at Garmadon about the fact that he never wants to be like him and that he hates Oni. And when watching, this seemed to me like set up for an arc where Lloyd would learn that he was wrong about the Oni, and that he must accept that being like his father isn't a bad thing. But Lloyd doesn't really learn anything. Lloyd is just angry with Garmin on the entire season, and while it's not completely without reason, so much time is spent showcasing how much Lloyd hates his dad that it just makes me question why I'm even really rooting for this guy. Am I saying that Lloyd can't be angry at his dad, or that a good character can never act bad? Of course not. And I think Lloyd having conflict with Garmadon is exactly what needed to happen in this season. But they push it so far that it just feels kind of uncomfortable. And you have these scenes where Garmadon is visibly hurt by what Lloyd is saying to him, and he's trying to reason with him, and this would have been a perfect point for Lloyd to try and get the gears turning in his head that maybe he should rethink how he feels about Oni, 
and we start to see that a little bit, but it never gets to the point where Lloyd actually learns what he's doing wrong. There's never any reconciliation moment, and there's never any growth. Even in the final scene, the dialogue that they share, Lloyd is still arguing with him about how useless Oni power is, showing that he literally learned nothing throughout the entire season. And maybe the lesson they wanted to actually push is that Oni power is bad, and that you don't want to harness that part of yourself, but then why have Garbanon be such a sympathetic character? Why have that arc in the same season where Garbanon, an Oni, is learning how to be good? It's so clear during the season that Lloyd is wrong about Oni, and that Garbanon is the one that we should be sympathizing with. But the season never makes any efforts to actually correct Lloyd's viewpoints. Why go through the effort of making your character seem like a jerk if they aren't actually gonna learn from it? The perfect resolution for the character arc is right there. There are a thousand ways you could have made him realize he was wrong about Oni, but he just never does. And what baffles me is that one of the final shots of the finale is Lloyd and Garmadon working together, like their best pals while Wu just says, Remarkable. Like, what? They still have so many unresolved issues, yet the season acts like they both made up in the end and worked everything out. It leaves me just feeling really confused. And I just want to be clear that I do not hate this dynamic. Lloyd being angry with Garmadon creates some interesting conflict, and some of the dialogue here is really good. And some of the dialogue is not so good. But regardless of the dialogue, I really like this scene here. Tell me one thing you care about. One thing! Plants don't count! Plants aren't people! They don't have feelings! It doesn't care that you abandoned it, or that you never sent it a birthday card, or... What's the point? You'll never understand. Yeah, some of the dialogue is not great, but the way that it is driven by the plant is what's important. And I also have to point out, Garmadon also wasn't the nicest to Lloyd during the season, mainly during his Oni power training, but Garmadon later learns and makes attempts to bond with Lloyd later in the season, because remember, Garmadon's whole character arc is becoming good despite the fact that he is an Oni. Because again, the problem isn't with characters being mean. A character can be mean, but it's important that if they're a protagonist and they're someone we need to root for, they need to learn from their mistakes and grow as a character so that I can still sympathize with them by the end of the season. And we see this really interesting point in the season where Garmadon wonders if anyone even trusts him at this point, and I think this is a really interesting idea to explore. But Lloyd just completely ignores the conversation, and we never actually get to see it. We never get to see the issue of trust resolved in the season. The idea for this is really cool. Garmadon second-guessing himself as his own son can't even trust him, but it just doesn't go anywhere. And speaking of things that don't go anywhere... In Crystal Eyes, we learn that since Lloyd is part Oni, much like how he can harness the powers of creation, he can also harness the powers of destruction through his Oni form. This is something fans speculated on for a while, but I'm not sure many people actually expected the show to explore this idea. The prospect of Oni Lloyd is fantastic. Having Lloyd, a traditionally good character, have to embrace an evil part of himself to defeat the big bad of the series is such a good idea for an ending. Having Lloyd, after all this time, embrace his father's side of the family and learn that Oni can be capable of amazing things is such an amazing way to wrap up his character after all these years. Wait, that's not what happened? Lloyd didn't use his Oni powers to defeat the Overlord? He still resents Oni by the end of the season? The best way I can describe Oni Lloyd is missed potential. The season spent so long building up to Oni Lloyd, and all that buildup was fantastic. There are so many amazingly written and acted scenes of Lloyd discovering his Oni powers and being manipulated by people like Harumi into harnessing them. Him breaking out of the Benchstone cage and fighting Harumi is one of the coolest scenes in this entire show, but whenever I watch a scene, it just makes me sad knowing that the perfect character arc for Lloyd was in arm's reach, but for whatever reason, the season just doesn't go through with it. 
So basically, for Lloyd to use his Oni powers, he must harness his anger and release it. Harumi manipulates us to her advantage to try and get him to turn to the side of destruction. And Lloyd obviously doesn't want to go through with the Oni power because in his mind, the Oni are known for destruction and devastation. And his greatest fear is becoming like his father. He doesn't want to be evil. But he is later told that the Oni power is actually vital when it comes to defeating the Overlord. So for Lloyd to defeat the Overlord, he must embrace his Oni side. And again, like I said, such a good setup for an interesting story, especially when Garmadon literally spends half the season with Lloyd. But when the time comes for Lloyd to embrace his Oni powers, he gets over three seconds and then gets scared by his reflection. And you know what? This is good. It makes sense for Lloyd to be scared away from his reflection at first. It's a perfect parallel to the mirror scene from Secrets of the Forbidden Spinjitzu, but that's where Lloyd's Oni arc ends. He never attempts to try again, and after that he just resorts back to using the powers of creation to defeat the Overlord. It's so incredibly unsatisfying to see only Lloyd being built up throughout the entire season only for Lloyd to never use it to defeat the Overlord. And this isn't just from a fan perspective, obviously this is something that fans have been wanting to see, but purely from a storytelling perspective, which is what this entire review is based off of, why spend so much time building up to something if it doesn't actually matter? The idea of Oni Lloyd is so promising and so interesting but ultimately wasted. But there's also a counter argument to this, and it's something I touched on a little bit earlier in the Garmadon section. And that's the fact that the arc is trying to portray that by denying Oni power, Lloyd is actually forging his own path and finally going against all the titles that have been placed on him over the years. And you know what? That sounds like an amazing story, but that's not the story I get when watching this unfold in the actual season. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't remember a single time in Crystallized where Lloyd ever said anything about his title as the Green Ninja, or that he had a problem with his title as the Green Ninja, and yes, while that stuff has been said in the past, particularly in Sons of Garmadon, it's important that if you're telling the story in this season, you need to reference that stuff back again to make it relevant to the current plot. No time in the season does Lloyd ever take issue with the fact that he's the Green Ninja, or the fact that he has to be responsible for everyone. The only time I can recall anything like this is in the very first episode, when Lloyd is so distraught about having to be responsible for people after the loss of Nia. But since that's completely dropped once Nia's back, and never brought up again, to me it just feels like kind of a stretch to say that this is what the arc was trying to portray. Not to mention the fact that Garmadon in this season is literally learning how to be good as an Oni, so even if there are examples of the show previously setting up the fact that Oni are evil and that Oni power can corrupt you, Garmadon in this season is fully proving that Oni can still be good. And I honestly give Garmadon props for how much patience he's able to have with Lloyd during this season. Like if I had to deal with Lloyd during this season, I would have unlocked my Oni power. In fact, I feel like I am right now while writing this review. So let's transition into a part of the season that I actually greatly enjoy. This is just such a cool idea, having some of Ninjago's most iconic villains all working together as a team, with each one of them having golden weapons, it's just so cool. Though I'd be lying if I said I wasn't just a little disappointed by their involvement in the season. Every scene with them is just amazing, their banter is fantastic, their characters are all captured perfectly, for the most part. I especially love the rivalry between Pythor and Asphira. I love seeing Vangelis and the mechanic back, as I feel both of them have had a lot more personality in this season than previous seasons, especially Vangelis. And Mr. F is just cool. Not as cool as Mr. E, but still awesome to see him here. My only issue mainly comes with the fact that they kinda just disappear for the second half of the season, only to reappear and be defeated almost instantly. The Crystal Council is used really well during a lot of the season. The way each member is revealed during the build-up to episode 12 is really, really good. And it really starts to build the suspense of the season so that once Lloyd finally enters the Crystal Temple, you see the entire council sitting next to each other, and it's a super impactful moment. Probably one of the most memorable moments in the entire season. And even the reveal of Harumi was fantastic, even if it was a bit predictable. Each scene with the villains just builds upon the last to create a sense of complete hopelessness, especially once Lloyd is captured. I feel like the Crystal Council really peaks in the episode Fall of the Monastery, where they have one of the best fight scenes in the season. It's so cool to see all these iconic Ninjago villains working together, especially after we saw all of them come together over the course of the first 12 episodes. Each of their personalities really bounce off each other, and they're all super fun to watch on screen. Once they get the crystallized gold and weapons, they're a force to be reckoned with. And the fight scenes that they share with Lloyd are fantastic, especially the one with Mr. F. 
but after this they kinda just stopped showing up. The Crystal Council was being used so well during the first half of the season, and I'd probably say that they're my favorite part of the first 15 episodes, but once the Overlord takes over Ninjago, they kinda just leave for the rest of the season. This is a huge missed opportunity. There is a lot of story potential behind seeing characters like Cole and Vangelis, or even Zane and Mr. F meet up again. There's some really interesting conflict that could come from that, especially because characters like Mr. F have never fully been explored. And I'm fine with the Crystal Council being here just for fan service, but they even missed out on awesome fans service potential. In the second to last episode of the season, we get to see the ninja rematch their respective villains, but the fights are so short that it doesn't actually feel very satisfying. I love the Zane vs Mr. F fight, and Cole's conversation with Vangelis is amazing, but that's all they did with these dynamics. The villains also get defeated super easily, and we never get to see what happens to them at the very end. They were so close to having the council be the perfect way to reflect on the past 11 years of Ninjago villains, but they failed to actually provide any closure for any of these villains, and their lack of screen time in the second half of the season makes them feel a bit irrelevant to the overall plot. At the start they seem super important to the Overlord's plan, it seemed like the weapons of destruction were a key to offsetting the balance, but after the Crystal Council obtained them, they don't actually do anything. We see some short scenes of Pythor and the mechanic respectively, but they're stopped super easily and barely put up a fight. It's great to see these characters, but they're so criminally underused. Don't get me wrong, I really like the Crystal Council, and it's definitely a big highlight of Crystallize for me, but I really wish we got to see more of them in the season, because there was just so much potential for interesting stories and conflicts there. Overall, it's a great concept with lots of missed potential, and you know, I'm starting to see a theme here. But at long last, we finally move on to the final character we have to talk about. The Overlord is a villain that I never really enjoyed. He's boring, he's one-dimensional, and overall he's just extremely generic. And I'm sad to say that he's the same way in Crystallized. I was actually kind of excited to see what they would do with the Overlord since it seemed that his motivation would actually be a bit different this time around. During the entire time he's in the season, he's always talking about the balance. Pretty much in order for there to be light, there must be darkness. It's something that we've known since season 2. What the Overlord wants to do is offset the balance so that there's never any conflict again. Which seems pretty interesting at first glance until you realize that it's just a glorified way of saying that he wants to corrupt Ninjago and turn everyone into zombies while stealing the ninja's powers for himself. So pretty much exactly what he did in season 2 and 3. And honestly, for the final season of an 11 year saga, it makes sense for the Overlord to be the big bad. But the least they could do is something interesting with him. And the balancing is great because it implied that he is after something different this time. And that he may believe that what he is doing is the right thing to do. He wants to stop all conflict, but of course the way he goes about it is morally wrong, which is a pretty good way to write a villain motivation, and it's been used in lots of media before. But by the end of the season, nothing was really done with this balance idea. At the end of the day, all the Overlord wants to do is take over Ninjago and become the most powerful ruler. It's so bland and basic, especially in a show where the villains are often more complicated than that. Like, he literally has a council of villains with motivations that were more interesting than his. Pyther wanted to get revenge on the surface world for locking him away after the first Serpentine War. Asura also wanted revenge, but against Wu for betraying her. Vangelis became greedy after realizing he could sell off Vengestone for huge amounts of money. Harumi wanted to make Lloyd feel the same pain she felt after losing her parents because she felt that it was his fault for their death, and so on. Some are definitely more simple than others, but they all act as much better motivations than I want to take over the world. But I honestly don't think that the Overlord's lack of interesting motivation would have been that big of an issue if all the other villains were actually present during the second half. Once the Overlord takes over, all the villain focus is on him. If we saw the entire Crystal Council and Rumi play a role in the plot during the Crystal Apocalypse, then we would have a handful of other interesting villains to contribute to the story, which I think would mask a lot of the issues that I have with the Overlord. Would I prefer that than them actually writing an interesting story for the Overlord? Well, no, I'd rather see a new and unique story for our main villain. But if they weren't interested in doing that, then the Crystal Council was right there to help carry the villain side of the season, and in fact they were carrying the villain side of the season until the Overlord officially came back. Like, I honestly think that the stuff with the Crystal Council was infinitely more interesting than what they did with the Overlord. But in terms of good things I could say about the Overlord, again I really like that they brought back the idea of the balance, but I really wish they went somewhere with it. His new design is also pretty cool and definitely my favorite design of his by far. His coolness factor has definitely bumped up quite a bit. His fight against Wu was phenomenal and I really like the aesthetic of the Vengestone Warriors and the Crystal Temple. It's clear that this is a big threat, which is very important when setting up stakes but that makes his overall defeat a lot more underwhelming. 
The way that the Overlord is defeated in the end just feels so easy and unearned, which really mostly just has to do with the missed potential of Oni Lloyd and a lot of other aspects I'll talk about when I get to the finale. But we are led to believe that this is the time where the ninja will actually defeat the Overlord once and for all. But what's stopping him from just coming back again? The balance is still maintained, and we know that since the show is continuing, conflict will still continue. So it really feels like nothing changes with the balance by the end of the season. So now with all the characters out of the way, let's actually talk about the season and its events. After the departure of Nia, the ninja come back together and begin investigating the mysterious Vengestone operations. Meanwhile, Nia is remembering who she is. The ninja are also being overshadowed by a group of new ninja, and worry about being replaced. After a brief fight between Kai and Jay, Nia appears and tells them that if they can drain her powers, she can be brought back. The ninja break Asphira out of jail and steal her staff in order to drain Nia's powers. Asphira initially uses this opportunity to attempt to get revenge on the ninja, but soon the police arrive to arrest the ninja, so Asphira complies. Nia is brought back and the ninja are arrested. So regardless about how I feel about Nia coming back, this is a really fun set of episodes. Everything from the emotional moments of the start to the high-speed action as the ninja attempt to steal Asphira's staff, everything's just done extremely well. My problem with this set of episodes really only comes from the fact that we don't get enough focus on how the ninja feel after the loss of Nia, and the fact that in the grand scheme of the season this arc is ultimately pointless since Nia coming back adds nothing to the plot afterwards and only makes way for another arc that is essentially just a waste of time. But overall, these episodes are a lot of fun when viewed in isolation. The first two episodes hit you hard with some really good emotional moments, but the season's also able to balance its humor and emotion really well. Seeing his fear back is also super fun. The new ninja are funny and add some interesting conflict as the ninja contemplate the concept of being replaced, but of course we have to get another ninja out of shape art. I guess it's been a year and luckily they don't put too much emphasis on it, but it gets repetitive and we've seen it in so many seasons. We also get to see Mayor Trustable, who's a really funny and entertaining character, but it's weird that they put so much focus on him considering how he just really isn't in the season after episode 20. 12. But yeah, if you look at the arc in isolation, it's a fun little adventure for the ninja to go on, but in the grand scheme of Crystallized, it feels like a huge waste of time, especially considering the arc that it directly sets up. After helping Asphira escape and probably causing thousands of dollars in property damage, the ninja are arrested by the new ninja and go to prison. Here they meet up with some old friends like Ronin and Pythor. They also learn more about the Crystal King and how he's gathering Ninjago's biggest villains for his council. Meanwhile, Nia decides that she wants to become Samurai X since she doesn't have her powers anymore. After a while, the ninja finally break out with the help of Nia and Dara. Dara's van breaks down, so the ninja split up and eventually meet at Twitchy's to figure out what to do next. This entire arc is so incredibly pointless and honestly just kind of boring in parts. The pacing here is incredibly slow, and there's so many things that just did not have to be here. First off though, the big elephant in the room is that we have seen this before. And yeah, the first episode of the season is also something we've seen before, in the first episode of Tournament of Elements, but that's something that I can excuse, since the context is different enough and it's done so incredibly well, while also being very brief. If the prison arc was like that, then I wouldn't really have any issues. But this arc takes up four and a half episodes of the season. And this prison arc is just a longer and more tedious version of the one we saw in Skybound, and yes, I do think that these episodes are worse than the Skybound prison arc. I'm somebody that actually kind of enjoys the Skybound prison plot, it doesn't feel too long, and it allows for the ninja to get some much needed downtime, plus it's filled with a lot of fun scenes and gags that keep it interesting. The Crystallized Prison Arc is similar, but it's a lot longer and padded out with so much nonsense and unnecessary fluff. There are parts I like, however. Pythor's reintroduction is amazing, and seeing him actually interact with our main cast of ninja is great because yeah, that never really happens again in this season. I also really like the scene with Harumi taunting Lloyd about the Crystal King. It's extremely dramatic and it sets up stakes really well. And it also helps the plot move forward by providing Lloyd with some much needed info about who the main threat is. And in fact, this arc is pretty good with giving the ninja helpful clues about the council in natural ways. It's necessary that we see the ninja slowly piece together what's going on, and it makes the eventual reveal of the council much more satisfying. All that stuff is great, but it could have all been done in like two episodes. Instead, it takes four and a half. The prison arc had more time dedicated to it than the finale. It also feels really repetitive, with the ninja being accused of escaping twice before actually escaping the third time, and then we get the episodes of the ninja in the desert, and yeah, I just, I didn't like these episodes the first time I saw them, 
and I really don't like them now. And this may be a super hot take, but I just don't like the benefit of grief. This episode is so strange and so out of place and just incredibly pointless. Like, this is an episode that belongs in a season like the Fire Chapter or Prime Empire, not the finale of an 11 year saga. A lot of people point to this episode and say that it tells a really important message, and to that I agree. I think this episode tells an amazing message. It's in fact one of the only times in the season that it actually spreads a good message. But why is it now that this episode is happening? And while the message is great, the execution of it isn't. The episode is funny, it's entertaining, but it does not belong in this season, especially during what is already an extremely stretched out part of the story. We also don't need much time spent on Fugitive and Hound Dog McBrog. Like, in Skybound, we cut immediately from the ninja escaping the prison to the next major plot point because there's no reason for us to see them travel in the desert to get back to the city. So why is it that in Crystallize we have to spend so much time with them walking around the desert with characters that never play any important role in the plot? If Sally, or Fugitive, or even Hound Dog McBrog played any significant role in the actual plot of Crystallized, then I wouldn't have any problem with these episodes. But since they only show up for their specific episodes, and disappear and pretty much don't do anything outside of that, then I just see these as a waste of time. Hound Dog McBrog at least showed up again during the Crystal Apocalypse, but at that point he's so far removed from the story and they deal with him so fast that it doesn't even matter. And to be fair, yeah, Fugitive and Sally also show up, but they don't do anything plot important. They're just there to be cameos. Like, I would understand if this desert stuff was set up for something, but it just isn't. And at least when the ninja were actually in the jail, they learned something about the council and it acted as some setup for Pythor. But I just cannot wrap my head around why these desert episodes even exist. Overall, the prison arc just feels kind of like a big waste of time. I feel like the initial prison episodes are fine enough, but once the ninja escape, there's just so much unnecessary time spent wandering through the desert with a strange amount of focus placed on these side characters instead of characters that could have actually used more screen time. After leaving Twitchies, the ninja go to the mechanic's hideout in order to intercept his invitation to the Crystal Council. A fight ensues and the mechanic is defeated and tied up in the noodle truck. The ninja take the noodle truck as they track Lloyd who is disguised as the mechanic and is making his way to what we later find out to be the Oni Temple. Lloyd meets the Crystal Council and is quickly outed as the imposter among us. Harumi's identity as the Vengestone buyer is revealed and we learn how she was revived and summoned the Overlord. Harumi then attempts to get Lloyd to unlock his Oni powers as the ninja continues searching the subway tunnels in hopes of finding him. Harumi sets off a trap, but the ninjas survive in the first fake-out death of the season. The Crystal Council then arrive at the monastery and steal the golden weapons, as well as destroying the monastery. They head back to base and use them to unleash the Overlord. Meanwhile, the ninja are rescued and taken back to the old Sam X cave. Lloyd eventually escapes the Oni Temple and attempts to take Harumi with him, but that doesn't end up working. Wu saves Lloyd as the Oni Temple is now a floating fortress of destruction. So I honestly think that this is one of the most solid parts of the season. However, the stuff with Lloyd and Harumi that I went into great detail with earlier definitely still does bug me. But I think that the section does a really good job of building up the Crystal Council and the Overlord as big threats. The introduction of the Crystal Council is done really well, and the reveal of Harumi being the masked character was also well done, regardless about how I feel about her return. Episode 12 is really where the tone of the season shifts, to the point where it kind of feels like a completely different season than before. The stakes have been raised dramatically, and we finally get to see what the Overlord has been planning. The pacing here is also really good with no breaks or things to slow down the progression of the plot. Event after event happens as we see the villains growing stronger and stronger, which I think is a great way to set up the eventual Overlord takeover. This is also the section of the season where the Crystal Council actually plays a major role, which is extremely fun to see. And the monastery fight scene will always be a huge highlight of the season for me. The animation is amazing and you could really feel how Wu isn't holding back, and with the monastery being destroyed, the stakes are higher than ever before. It's also nice to see the OG4 ninjas sharing some scenes together. Overall, this part of the season is really good at one specific thing, and that's setup. It does an amazing job of raising the stakes and making the viewer excited to see how everything is gonna unfold, with the villains growing more and more powerful as each episode passes. All the main problems with this arc come from a lot of the characters themselves, mostly Harumi and Lloyd. Like I said before, the stuff between Lloyd and Harumi just feels extremely inconsistent and creates for a lot of confusion. So yeah, this part of the season was honestly really really good and gave me a ton of hope for the rest of the season, so let's see how that panned out. After helping Lloyd escape from the Oni Temple, the ninja go and defend a small village from the first of many Vengestone army attacks from the Overlord. 
The ninja grab a sample of the crystals and give it to Pixel, who is able to figure out how to combat its power due to the fact that the ninja's powers and vehicles seem to be ineffective. Meanwhile, Wu remembers that he's been receiving newspaper clippings that have been warning him about the Overlord's eventual return. Wu and Lloyd go to investigate the clippings to find out where they were coming from and find that they were being sent by none other than Garmadon who this whole time has been living with Vinny of NGTV News. Garmadon explains how he's trying to be good, but Lloyd isn't having it. At this point, the crystal attack has now reached Ninjago City, and Garmadon is here to try and teach Lloyd how to harness his Oni powers, since it's the only way they believe that they can actually defeat the Overlord. The ninja also got vehicle upgrades, but all end up crashing in various places throughout the city. While all that's happening, Wu decided that he would finally settle things with the Overlord, but he is quickly taken care of. And the Destiny's Bounty of course meets its crash quota for the season. At this point, all the ninja are split up, Wu is at the newspaper warehouse and transmits a message to encourage the city to come together and fight against the Overlord. Pixel and Zane then reunite with Ronin, as him and his team of prison escapees help to get her to Borg Tower. Ronin's crew also gets some new mechs, and one Zane death fight got later, they're on their way to find the others. During all that, Garmadon and Lloyd discovered the Serpentine Library and sent a message asking for help, while also discussing Oni power. Meanwhile, Kai, Cole, and Skylar make their way through the city, and Jay and Nia go to try and send a message to Malopia. Racer 7, or how she is now known, Blazy H Speed, returns and helps Cole get to the NGTV News Tower so that he can send a broadcast to Shintaro. Everyone meets back up at the warehouse after both signals fail to go through, or so they think. Everyone's prepared for battle, and Lloyd and Garmadon go to battle the Overlord. The allies appear, the ninja achieve dragon form, and defeat all the Crystal Council members, while also getting their golden weapons back. The Overlord reveals that he was the one that possessed the Great Devourer, and Harumi makes her official turn to the good side. Wu then realizes that the Overlord is trying to corrupt the powers of creation, so then sends the ninja to dispose of the powers, but then they go into Lloyd, they create a dragon that defeats the Overlord, Oh, and also, the Oni powers of course never mattered in the end. Garmadon plants Christopher, and everyone helps rebuild the monastery, and the end. All is good, and all is well. Okay, there's a lot to go through here, so let's take it step by step. The first major thing I notice about the setup episodes is that the pacing is back to being extremely slow. The way that they formatted these episodes is interesting because they kind of pulled a Master of the Mountain where they split off our cast of characters into a bunch of different areas and side plots. But I honestly think that the entire season peaked at the episode right before this, however. Brave but Foolish is the episode where I believe that the final battle should have truly begun, because it really feels like after this moment, where Wu saves himself from falling off the Oni Temple, all the stakes that the season spent so long building to just disappear. Because what you're left with after this is episode after episode of what feels like just stalling and build up before the final two episodes. Now don't get me wrong, these episodes have a lot of great moments, but it just feels like the season had so much momentum up until the ninja got all split up. Things were constantly elevating in terms of stakes and action, but nothing after ever even comes close to the fight between Wu and the Overlord. Brave But Foolish shows what the season finale could have been like. The stakes are extremely high, the fights and action sequences are breathtaking, and everything that the season had been building towards really starts to come together. I'm not saying that this is where the season should have ended, but I think this is where the actual final battle plot should have started instead of being crammed into the final two episodes. Because after this episode, all the momentum the season had just stops. It just comes to a screeching halt. And the season has to spend so many episodes building it back up to it again. And since the season already wasted so much time in the first half, it makes it even stranger that we spend so much time here focusing on characters like Blazy H Speed, when we could have been in the middle of a huge climactic battle arc that the season had been building up to this entire time. I understand that we gotta set up the Merlopians and the Shintarans to come back, but the payoff of those plotlines don't even feel satisfying because the fact that the cameos 1 never spoke and 2 honestly didn't really have that great showings. Seeing these characters come back was something that I was really hoping to see and technically my wish came true, but it unfortunately just feels really hollow the way it was executed. The one cameo character that actually has a speaking role is some random henchman from the island. There are good moments with these cameos, such as the Upley coming to rescue Cole and Chompy flying into battle. But for the most part, these cameos just feel empty. The thing that audiences like about characters is, well, their character. We like to see their personalities and what they do, what they say, what they can add to a situation. But none of these characters really do or say anything that shows off their personalities, and I think that a lot of this comes from the issue of there only being two episodes for the finale. Seabound got four episodes for its finale, over 40 minutes dedicated to its ending, and in my opinion, 
It paid off and allowed for an extremely well-paced, exciting, and satisfying ending. But the season that's supposed to be an ending to 11 years of stories only gets two episodes. Sure, the entire season is 30 episodes, but that's 28 episodes of build-up for a 20-minute finale. And in the 20 minutes we got of the final battle, pretty much nothing that was built up in the previous 28 episodes was paid off in a satisfying way, or even at all. So much time feels like it was wasted. I see a lot of criticism regarding the 11 minute episode format, or the fact that Crystallize didn't have enough episodes, but honestly, in my opinion, Crystallize just did not make a good use of the time that they actually had. The season had plenty of time to wrap up everything that was set up previously, but spent so much time on pointless plot lines that sure can be fun, but also take much needed time away from the finale. And honestly, yeah, 22 minute episodes were more favorable, but this is still the longest continuous Ninjago season ever made not counting season 11 since it was split into two parts. There is no excuse for having such a rushed ending, but let's go ahead and talk about the ending itself. So I already went in detail with Oni Lloyd and the Harumi Redemption, but let's talk about the Overlord's defeat. We were led to believe that this would be the time that the ninja are able to finally stop the Overlord once and for all, but it doesn't really feel like that's what happened, and honestly, it's not really clear exactly what happened. So Wu says that the Overlord doesn't want to destroy the ninja, but to take the powers for himself, which yeah, makes sense. It's a solid twist. But then Wu talks about how if you combine the weapons, the elemental powers will go back to where they originated from, which happens to be a four-headed dragon. That is very reminiscent of the Ultra Dragon, might I say. And then Lloyd uses that dragon to defeat the Overlord. Where did the stuff about the golden weapons come from? It seems like the writers just made up some lore on the spot in order to figure out a way for the Overlord to be defeated, even though Oni Lloyd is very much an option that has been set up the entire season. The thing about merging the golden weapons comes out of nowhere, even if you were to tell me that this makes sense within the lore, that the weapons combined can summon a four-headed elemental dragon, the solution still remains unsatisfying since it wasn't set up, and never mentioned before this moment. The dragon forms of the ninja were set up, they could have easily connected it to that, but it's connected to the golden weapons for some reason. And here's what might potentially be a hot take, but I don't think the overlord possessing the great devourer was a good reveal. Not because it doesn't make sense within the lore, because technically it does, but because the the reason this piece of lore was brought up was merely to serve for Harumi's redemption. It comes up as a forced way to get Harumi to be mad at the Overlord, when you literally have so many reasons that Harumi could be mad at him without it. These random lore bits are cool on paper, but are just used to get the plot to where it needs to be, when all this stuff could have just been handled naturally with what was already set up. Like the chess pieces are already there, why are you inventing new chess pieces when you don't need them? Why not use the lore that has already been pre-established within the season, like you know the dragon forms and Oni Lloyd? Wouldn't it make sense if the ninja all merged to create the Ultra Dragon instead of using the golden weapons? Or maybe if Oni Lloyd had to use his four arms to hold all the golden weapons at once to create the dragon? That would be a great way to tie back all the way to season one when Garmadon wanted to hold all four weapons at once. Like we've had so many four arm characters at this point that we've completely forgotten why Garmadon even had four arms to begin with. It was to hold all four golden weapons at once. Imagine how cool it would be if Lloyd could do that in his Oni form. Like there are so so many interesting things that the season could have done. Everything was right there for it to happen, but it just didn't do it. The way Crystal Eyes ends feels really cheap and really hollow, because instead of paying off what was set up previously, it decided to create new rules in order to fit its narrative, on top of essentially telling us that everything the season was building up to didn't actually matter, and that everything that the last five seasons did for Ninjago didn't matter. Because at the end of the day, everything has returned to the never-changing, always-present status quo. I wanted to love Crystallized. I expected to love Crystallized. And for most of its episodes, I did love Crystallized. But after that finale, and after I've taken the time to evaluate the season as a whole, it is in my opinion Lego Ninjago's biggest disappointment. Is it Ninjago's worst season? No, definitely not. It has a lot of great things about it, but it just leaves me feeling more sad than anything. Sad for what it could have been. It seems like the season had been building up to so many amazing and interesting ideas, but back down at the last minute. It had the potential to be the greatest Ninjago season of all time, wrapping up 11 years of stories with one big grand finale. But unfortunately, that's not how I view Crystallized. 
Crystal Eyes to me fundamentally misunderstood what Ninjago is supposed to be, and more importantly, what its characters are supposed to be. And by the end of the day, the show is almost unrecognizable. And that may sound extreme to say, but when I watch the final scene of the season, and I see Lloyd wave to Harumi as Inner Steel plays in the background, I just don't know what show it is that I'm watching anymore. And I hate that I feel this way. I hate that this is how the season had to turn out. And if you're someone who enjoys Crystallized, then that's fantastic. Because at the end of the day, we all have our own opinions, and we all have our own thoughts, and we all have our own feelings about what Ninjago should and shouldn't be. And if you found Ninjago Crystallized to be a really good season and a good ending to 11 years of stories, then I am honestly jealous. Because I really wish I could feel the same way. So what does this mean going forward? Of course, I still love Ninjago, and if that wasn't true, you wouldn't be watching this video right now. I'm still interested to see what happens with the show in 2023, and I still plan to make plenty of retrospectives on the channel of older seasons. Crystallize may even be a topic that I revisit one day in the future because yeah, after all that, I still have more to say on it. Ninjago still has plenty of seasons ahead of it, I'm sure, and I would be surprised if there wasn't another season in the future that I fall in love with just like I have with a lot of the previous seasons. But as of now, all I see in Ninjago Crystallized is Miss Potential. Thank you guys so much for watching this review. If you made it all the way to the end, congrats. This has definitely been the biggest project on the channel so far, so I hope you enjoyed it. As always, I appreciate the comments and the support. And yeah, hopefully we can all agree to uh, disagree on some things here, because I know that not everyone's gonna agree with this video, but others may agree on this video. I heavily doubt a single person's gonna agree with literally every single thing I said, but feel free to have any crystallized discussion in the comments below. I'm really interested to see what you guys think about it as well. And like I said at the end there, I'm not gonna be stopping the channel. I still love Ninja and I'm still gonna be making videos on it, both now and on future seasons, I'm sure. And yeah, I just hope you guys really enjoyed this video. I put a ton of time into it. And yeah, thank you guys so much for watching. I'll see you guys in the next video. Have a great rest of your day, and goodbye.